Number seven ministries. The spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to release the oppressed number seven ministries welcome everyone to number seven ministries christian outreach today's sermon is called virtual full the definition of virtual of relating to or being hypothetical particle particle whose existence is inferred from indirect evidence simulated this guy behind me some of you may say hey he looks crazy or he looks like a fool you know he's got a big buck teeth in the front his eyes are real beady going uh those are uh, actually extropia his pupils are going in two different directions he's got a big nose a tongue hanging out funny looking ears and he looks virtually like a fool but guess what he's not real he's virtual And I'm going to tell you a lot of times when we are closely walking and following behind Jesus Christ, we are going to virtually look like a fool to those who are of the world, to those who have their eyes spiritually closed. And I want to encourage you that no matter how you appear to the world, to go ahead and keep following Jesus. Because not everything, that every path that Jesus takes us on is going to be a glamorous. A lot of the paths that God calls for us to go through, we're going to look like a virtual fool. But I want to tell you to be encouraged because you're not a fool. You just may appear. The definition of fool is one who is deficient in judgment, sense, or understanding. One who acts unwisely or given on occasion made to appear ridiculous. Informal, a person with a talent or enthusiasm for certain activities. In other words, sometimes people have such a passion about a particular thing that they appear to be foolish. Have you ever seen in Cleveland, Ohio, a Browns fan? I mean, they get geared up and they dress up like a dog. They have dog bones around their neck and chains and the painted orange and and black. And sometimes to a person who doesn't know anything about football or may not be a football fan, which means fanatical, they might appear to them who doesn't understand or doesn't share likewise enthusiasm towards the game. They might appear to be a fool. The more, uh, the, the more support that the Browns players believe that you have towards the team. It also, in definition of a fool, is a member of a royal or noble household who provided entertainment, as with jokes or antics, a jester, one who subverts convention or varies from social conformity in order to reveal spiritual or moral truth, a holy fool. Now this is in a secular dictionary. A mental deficient person, an idiot, one who subverts convention or orthodoxy or varies from social conformity in order to reveal spiritual or moral truths, a holy fool. So I'm going to ask you to, to, to ask yourself this question. Do I ever appear to be a virtual fool? Or do I always appear to look cool? Because I'm going to say that being cool or looking cool is not necessarily evil in and of itself up until the point that being cool causes you to be astray from the path that God has you to be on. And I really believe in my heart that God purposely chooses us to to do things that look foolish to the world so that we could be humbled, 
And in our humility, we ourselves, our flesh, decreases, which is the only way that God can increase in our life. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10. It says, we are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honorable, but we are despised. Everything in God is almost the extreme and exact opposite of the world. I remember for a good 10 years, my grandma, who's now deceased, she used to call me up on the phone and tell me that she's pregnant on April Fool's Day. And every time, she never changed the story. She never changed the approach. I mean, it was the same story every April Fool's. And guess what? She got me every time. Really? You're pregnant, Grandma? I didn't even know. Who's the man? I'm like ready to go over there and beat someone up. Who's the man? Got you pregnant. And then, my, then I would hear my grandma roaring laughter. Joey, how can I be pregnant? I'm 80-some years old. <sighs> Got me again, Grandma. It's April Fool's. Happy April Fool's. Every year. And, and you would think that after 10 years, I would catch on. <laughs> but I didn't. And not long ago, we were at the prison, and uh, Brother Augie was there. The chaplain, when he was giving us a tour of the prison, he said, and over there, there was uh, plastic fences, white plastic fences. And he said, and over there, that's when we ha where we have our bullfighting. And I said, really? We got bullfighting over there? He was like, no, no, come on. We don't have bullfighting over here. That's actually... In, uh, uh, a botanical garden for the inmates to do a class. Now the only bullfighting we might have is if the tomatoes are fighting for territory with the roots trying to get more nutrients. But other than that, there's no bullfighting. And, and then he said something else I don't remember, but he got me twice in a row. And then after that point, I, I, everything that he said from that point on, I questioned him. But uh, Chaplain Berger from uh, Belmont Prison, he's a beautiful, dear friend of mine. And I uh, really thank God for him. And God's really using him. And uh, we should pray for our leaders and for those that have, uh, that God has put in positions. Um, because y you have no idea the discouragement, the criticizing, the judgment, the misunderstanding, the unappreciated, the abuse that the devil gives towards the leaders that God put into place. And 90% of that abuse comes from the body of Christ. I remember when I was in college, um, there was a particular English class that I was the only student that got an A on a few assignments. And I remember the teacher just showering. I mean, she really threw me under the bus and left me for target practice with that class. She came into the class and she flipped, flipped through all these homework assignments, these English uh, essays, and she said, I don't know what is wrong with you people. You guys have some garbage essays. The only essay in this class that I even tolerated and enjoyed and gave an A was Joseph Collini. <laughs> and I was like, no! From that point on, I knew oh, she, I don't know what she did to me, but she really, re I felt like Joseph from the Bible, the coat of many colors. She, she p positioned me in a place to be attacked. Yeah, maybe it was a compliment in her own mind, but you don't do that. You should not do that as a pastor to people in the church. You should not do that as a parent to your children. You should not never do that as a teacher to the class because you're setting, you're setting a tax. And maybe God orchestrated that. I don't know. But I remember walking out of the class and a particular girl who I'm still friends with to this day, she said, oh, you're, you're Mr. Uh, Straight-A student and you always get A's in class and, you know, you're, you're gifted in your education. And I turned around and I looked at her. I said, I said, no disrespect, but you don't know me. 
I just got my GED in prison two years ago. I didn't even know the order of my months two years ago. I could not multiply or divide and could barely read a book two years ago. And when I said that, her jaw dropped. I said, it's only because of God that I could ever do anything good. I'm not a naturally gifted education person. In fact, when I first became a Christian, I never even read the Bible. And guess what? Without ever reading the Bible, God chose me and called me to be a preacher before I ever had a college degree, before I ever had a GED before I had any theological understanding at all, and before I ever read the Bible, God called me and chose me, which is an abomination in many people's eyes. What, what, who does that man think he is to be able to tell me about the Bible? What are his qualifications? You know what my qualifications are? I'm alive. That's my qualifications because I was going to kill myself. And I was only reading the Bible because I realized how messed up I was and how much I needed help. And God said, that foolish thing that the world would cast and reject, that's the person that I called. God's choices are not according to what the world considers to be a good choice. Because God said, no, they'll take all the credit, all their degrees and all their education and all their qualifications and how perfect they are and how good they are, how they've never did any sins and they've never been to jail and all these things. And God said, well, you know what? You guys will honor that person because of his outward success. And then I won't get no glory. And people will start putting credit where credit shouldn't be due. People will start putting credit in the flesh. And God said, no flesh is going to glory in my eyes. So that's why God chose us, the foolish things of the world. You may feel like you might count yourself out for multiple reasons. My speech is not of oratorical skills. <laughs> I can't, I stutter, I slur. God said, perfect. That's who I want. I'm ugly looking. God said, perfect. <laughs> I'm big and overweight. God said, perfect. That's who I want to use. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Amen. You know, I wish that since I've been serving God, that I could have pride in all the money that I have. I wish that I could have pride in all the theological degrees that I have. I wish I could have pride in all the thousands of members that come to my church. I wish I could have pride in those things, but I can't. I can't because I don't have those things. I wish I could have pride in myself how great and fantastic I, are, I am, but I can't. I can't. And when I first got saved, I had nothing. There was nothing in the natural that I was able to put pride in. Everything was stripped from me. The only thing that I had the possibility to put pride in was Jesus. Jesus was everything, and he still is. We have to keep that perspective that we are who we are, not because of the natural things but because of the spiritual thing, because of the Word of God, because of our relationship with Jesus, because of how much He loves us. This is where we should keep our emphasis, the foolish things to confound the wise. Do you know that my first sermon that I ever gave was in the jail when I was locked up? And I was not preaching to preach a sermon, I w and I never wanted to preach. In fact, again, I was realizing how messed up I was in jail, having routinely messed up my life. I didn't mess up my life in a one-time event. It was a routine thing. And I was sitting in the jail cell in a bunk that came off of the wall and went down. And I was sitting up there reading my Bible, wanting to be alone, wanting to be left alone, only wanting to read the Bible for my own self, because I knew I was messed up and I knew I needed help. And I love God because he showed me how much he loved me. And one person in the jail came in my jail cell and he asked me, I remember his name, I can't share it. But I, he asked me a question about the Bible. 
And in my heart, I wanted him to leave my jail cell. I wanted to be alone. I wanted some alone time with me and God. I wanted him to. I didn't even want him to be in my jail cell. I almost was ready to kick him out. And then he was asking questions. And then a second person came in the jail cell. And then a third person. And then a fourth person. And then a fifth, a sixth, and a seventh person came into the jail cell. And without any effort at all on my own, I started preaching. But not I, but him inside of me started preaching. It started coming out. And it was almost like autopilot. I wasn't using my lack of knowledge. I wasn't using my lack of degrees. I wasn't using my lack of people. I was only a vessel. And this preaching started coming out of me on autopilot, and I had an outer body experience. And while this preaching was taking place, I literally felt and saw my soul left my body, and I started looking down at myself, and I saw myself preaching to other people, and I was watching it. And then I heard this voice say, look at what you're doing. Look at what you're doing. I've called you to do this. And I'm not sharing this story to appear to be super spiritual or anything because I still sin, I still fall short, I'm still living by God's grace alone. But I share it to say that we come to God not by our own strength or by our own might, but God. See, look at that, that, first, that third word. It says, but God chose. I didn't choose this. See, because our choices are often the wrong choices. Our choices are often off of our logic, our, our wisdom, our flesh, our feelings, our desire, our desires. But God chose. But God chose. And you could almost take a black marker and scratch out that foolish and put your name in there. God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. Who is the wise? Those that don't know Jesus. Those that can intellectualize and justify their sin because they're geniuses, but on their way to hell. God chose and put your name, the foolish thing. God chose it. You didn't choose. See, our, there's nothing inside of us that would want, ever want God. In our natural self, we're greedy, we're selfish, we're lustful, we're arrogant, we're prideful. Nothing in us would choose Jesus. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 5, it says, It says, And no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to work the ground. In this Bible verse, it says that there was not yet rain. No man on earth at this point had ever seen, had ever known, have ever felt, have ever experienced, have ever tasted rain. It's never happened before. They never knew anything about it. And in spite of the lack of education, the, f the lack of scientific evidence, the lack of man's experience with rain, God chose, God called Noah and his family to build an ark. And it's never been understood what rain was. Why would you prepare for something that's never happened before or no one's ever experienced before? God chose Noah to build an ark and to prepare for something that's never happened before. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Maybe you've never done something that's never been done before in mankind. But has God ever called you to do something that you've never done before? Because God calls us in areas to leave our comfort zone for what we do know. And this is the only way for us to grow spiritually. God will call us out of our comfort zone. God will call us out of what we know. No, lo no longer can we depend on our education. No longer can we depend on our family support. No longer can we depend on our money or our finances. We have to leave those things to move on with God. Noah found favor in God's eyes because he was willing to let go of all those things and obey God. 
and look in the eyes of people to be a virtual fool. Can you blame, if, if, when he was building this ark and people were roaring, laughing at him, ridiculing him, rejecting him, can you blame them? For laughing. I'm not saying that. I don't know whether they did. Can you blame them? If they persecuted him, if they mocked him, if they made fun of him, if they thought he was a fool, can you blame them? I'm going to tell you, when you're really doing something that God called you to do, people are going to laugh at you. They're going to mock you. They're going to ridicule you. But can you blame them? Because you're doing something that appears to be virtually foolish. Because you're not walking by sight. You're walking by faith. Can you blame people in your life for laughing at you, for misunderstanding you? No, you can't. The only thing you would do is humble yourself, stay consistent on the path that God called you on. Don't waver. Don't look behind you. Don't look to your left or your right. You keep your eyes focused on Jesus and keep moving, trucking ahead. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 17 and 18, it says, I am going to bring floodwaters on the earth. Now, most theologians will agree on this, that it was about 55 to 120 years before God sent the flood. 55, I heard as low as 55 and as high as 120 years. God waited. And I'm going to tell you, I don't believe that it took even remotely that long to build the ark. And my question to you is this, why? Did God wait 55 to 120 years before he sent the flood? I'm, I believe, in my opinion, that God waited 55 to 120 years before he sent the flood to give grace, period, to those to repent of their sinful ways. Those who some believe that uh, had intercourse with demons and they were demon-possessed people and God wanted to destroy that spirit within those people. God gave them an option, an opportunity to repent for 55 to 120 years and I believe they rejected God. They didn't want nothing to do with Him. They chose to live life the way they wanted to live life. And God gave them a 55 to 120 years. I'm going to tell you, God's not like me because I wouldn't have gave him five minutes. I would have threw the lightning bolt and the flood immediately. <laughs> God is so much more gracious and loving than myself. His judgment goes far beyond the mercy that I could come up with. And on top of that, I believe that God allowed the persecution, the rejection, the virtual fool of Noah for 55, 100, year, 20 years to test Noah, to see would Noah stop doing what God called him to do. It's never rained ever before. Nobody could understand. Nobody could comprehend. Nobody can reference why he was doing what he was doing, but he still was steadfast. God was testing Noah, and just like the days of Noah, so it will be in these days, God is going to test us. Are we going to keep serving God? Are we going to keep giving? Are we going to keep serving? Are we going to keep believing in spite of how hard things look, in spite of how hard things are? Are we going to ignore this world for the eternal realm that waits for those that are saved. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 7 it says, well, we walk by faith, not by sight. In John chapter 3 verse 8 it says, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. See, when we're born with the spirit, we can only have limited projections of how our life is going to unfold. And God is only going to give us limited projections of how our life is going to unfold. He will call us, command us, and choose us to do something, but he's not going to lay all the intricate details and all of the, He's not going to show us those things. Did God tell Noah the day that it was going to flood? Or did God just say it's going to flood? Believe me at my word. No, he didn't say the exact day, the date. It was by faith. See, when we're being led by the Spirit, we don't even know what we're going to do. 
if you're a real true pastor, you can have an idea or uh, any, any, any Christian. You can have idea what you're going to do for the day. You can have a projection, but you don't know exactly how things are going to unfold or how things are going to come out or what exactly you're going to do if you're being led by the Spirit. See, people who are religious but spiritually dead, they have an agenda, they have it in a box, and they won't deviate from that agenda no matter what, even at the expense of disobeying God, uh, grieving the Holy Spirit, not being led by the Spirit, just keep staying forward. Then in that, there's no yokes, and, uh, yokes that are going to be broken. There's no deliverance that's going to come out of that, no joy, no peace, no healing. No, Jesus. But on the same sense, too, you have some people who call themselves so spiritual that they're rebellious, they're not consistent, they're not loyal, they're not faithful. They have, <laughs> they're just wild things, too. So I do believe that in our walk with God, there should be some type of balance. In Judges chapter 16, verse 25, it says, While they were in high spirits, they shouted, Bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he performed for them, and they stood him among the pillars. Oh yeah, Samson performed for them. You know, they gouged out Samson's eyes. And they said that, you know, we want to make sport of him. Some versions say, we wanted to make sport. Like the Browns game. We wanted to be entertained at the expense of Samson. I'm going to tell you, when you have a gift that God gave you, there's going to be other people that are going to try to kill your gift and kill you and stop you from moving in the things that God called you. And they will try to be entertained at your expense. They will try to make sport of you. But I'm going to tell you, he who laughs first, laughs last. Don't worry about them laughing at you. Don't worry about them being entertained at how foolish you look at this time. Because when it's all said and done, Samson took out more people in his death than he did in his life. All those people that were laughing, he knocked down the pillars and the roof come, come caving down. But in order for him to defeat the enemies at that point in time when they were laughing, Samson had to die to himself. And so what it will be with us as Christians, we are going to have to die to ourself in order to defeat the enemies of God. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 48. As the Philistines moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet him. You know, David looked like a fool trying on Saul's armor and his weapons. It was so heavy, it looked ridiculous on him. You know, when people were laughing at who is, they, they looked down on him. They looked down on him. Who is this man that's going to defeat a giant? He's not even in the arm. He has no training. He doesn't meet our criteria of the height and the weight and the muscle tone of who would be a true Israeli soldier. But yeah, God looked past those things and said, I chose them. Don't worry about it. I'm going to give them victory in spite of your misjudgment towards him and you know what what why they were laughing why goliath was ridiculing i mean he was he was laughing he was laughing laughing at david david heard the laughter and he ran towards him he ran he heard the laughter of his comrades but yet he still ran towards his enemy I'm going to ask you the question, why people are laughing? Are you going to run towards your enemy? Believing God's going to give you victory. Keep running. Hebrews chapter two, 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. Look at this. Jesus, who is the finisher of our faith. You know what? Your husband, your wife, God bless them. The pastor, God bless them. The teacher, God bless them. The police officers, God bless them. The president, God bless them. The White House, God bless them. The enemies of God, God bless them. The friends of God, God bless them. You know what? There's only one person who is the author and the finisher of our faith, and that is Jesus Christ.